trick that uh, we can use for edge finding. I want to find the center of this plate from these flats. But with this edge finder, uh, I'm going to have trouble. Now I can use a different edge finder that's a uh, half inch all the way down, but if you only have one edge finder like this, the problem you have, you can start hitting on the top piece here before the edge. And so what you can do is you can take a nice ground block, make sure your surface is clean, and then you can come down and press up against it. And now you can edge find this edge like so. Set your digital to zero and just repeat it on the other side and use your digital uh, the halfway mark and then you'll be right in the half. So Michael, why don't you go ahead and do the other side there. Okay, and then we can come up to the digital, and we can see that our distance is 7, 9, 52, and 4 tenths. And these digitals are pretty nice because I can just come over here, hit half, and now it sets my halfway mark. So I don't even have to do the math. I just push the right buttons, and we'll be centered. And so if I come over this way now... Now I'm sitting on the center of this, and Michael's going to go ahead and edge find uh, this. I'm going to move off. We're going to drill it and tap some holes halfway between. So I'll, those are a half inch spacing, so I'm just going to move over 250 thousandths. And that way I can drill a tap halfway between on both. And then, Michael, all you have to do is just repeat and find the center right there. And then we can place our first hole. Here comes a good application for using uh, Tapmatic uh, tapping head. Uh, it'll make tapping these holes a lot faster. Uh, there's, I believe, uh, over 110 holes in uh, there that we'll be tapping out. And uh, I got things set up so that the vise is, it's not snug, but it's uh, set so that uh, this can slide back and forth. And I got a clamp on the parallel to hold that in place and this rubber band will help a little bit I don't have a clamp big enough to get over there but we have our stop sitting in the back for this activator arm and here's one of the nice features that we have on uh, these new vice jaws that we're making uh, that some of you have seen uh, we have these series of tap toes in the top and I have this rail with slots on it and in this case I, I want to have that on there so that it'll keep the part from lifting up. Uh, there, there's about five thousandths uh, a gap in there. What I, what I did is based on my parallel height and uh, with the thirty thousandth shim underneath there, it uh, gives me about the right height. And uh, 
So what we're going to do now, we're going to go ahead and oil this first row up, get the tap oiled up. Oh, by the way, uh, these are an A tap. Uh, we just bought these. They're a little more expensive. They're about $25 a piece. Uh, everybody I know that uses these swear by them. And so this will be the first real test that I've ran them with. Adam's used them a few times. I've never tapped with them yet. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. As you can see, it goes pretty fast, and I think this tap is cutting good enough. I'm going to crank the RPMs up a little bit. It'll go even faster. We chamfered these uh, plates on the front and back, and by doing that, uh, we won't have to come back and chamfer it later, uh, because if you drill your hole and you tap, tap it, and then you chamfer it, uh, what will happen is a lot of times you'll mess up that first thread. And when you do that, you got to come back and run the tap through again. This way, we'll avoid having to do the extra work of running that tap through the hole to clean that uh, first thread out again. I love this automatic tap head. It makes short work out of projects like this. And so far that A-tap is working really nice. Very free cutting. And we have the clutch package set on here for the OSG High Pro 7. And uh, I could tell this, this tap is cutting a lot nicer. So even though they're more expensive, uh, they... Uh, last a lot longer and they're tougher and uh, they can uh, tap uh, some of your harder materials uh, you know your D2's and M2's and we primarily got it uh, because we were having trouble tapping uh, DC 53 uh, the taps were wearing out quite fast and uh, this so far seems to be doing the job
Well, here we got it. I counted all the holes uh, in here. There was 117 holes in this last row. Uh, you can see that uh, where the tap should be the dullest. That screw is going in nice and smooth. Uh, it feels pretty much like it does even on some of the first ones. Yeah, just real nice and smooth hose. Now, uh, this is a 41032 counterbore hose for mounting on the spin fixer. But what's uh, interesting, when uh, I use a 205 drill for my tap drill size, but for my clearance from a counterbore, I'm using a 205 too. So even though this is for 1032, I went ahead and tapped this. And so now I got threads in that that I can use as well. So I can use my 1032s that go all the way through to mount it. And then I can tap it. And uh, I did a whole series of counter bores in three rows over here so that I got that counter bore in numerous places. And that's for some other fixture work that I'll be doing and uh, where I need to screw things to the top uh, with these 1032s. So this will be a multifunction plate. Uh, I have yet to tap these holes in both sides and the end, and uh, we won't go over that. It'll just uh, be some more of the stuff that you saw. But when we finish that, uh, then we're going to go and we're going to heat treat this using uh, the Hot Shot 360 oven that we got from Stan at Bar Z Industrial. Uh, I love that uh, oven. It works great. Uh, this will be one of the bigger parts that I've heat treated in it. And so we'll just go through the process and show the software and how everything works there too. Yeah, you can see right now we're within two degrees of our hitting our target, one degree. And that took uh, about four and a half minutes. So it was almost five minutes. And what I think I'm going to do in that configuration file for all of them, I think I'm going to change that to a 20-minute minimum uh, at that point because most of the heat treat I do, I start with the oven cold, and, and this whole oven will heat up, and it draws energy. Uh, once it's warm, it, uh, the temperature, the actual temperature can keep up with the target temperature a little bit better, and you can make a smaller number than that. Like I say, if I'm going to be going from a cold oven, I'll keep that in consideration. In large parts, I'll throw a bigger number in there. But you can see the fluctuation. Our target is 1760. Uh, our actual is 1760, and that will probably just vary about one degree. That's how uh, good these controls are and uh, how well stands got them set. And it should stay at this point. Uh, it should give us... A, at least a 35 minute soak time uh, take away five minutes when uh, the actuals keep uh, trying to catch up with the target yeah so you can see how nice and consistent our actual is to our target it's not even changing at this point but when it does change it's usually just a degree and it will make its adjustments so we'll come back at the end of the cycle when we're pulling the part out. Okay. Is it going? Okay, so the timer goes off and we got the light comes on and we got it set so that the audio audible alarm as well. And that will go on for about a whole minute uh, and it'll maintain that temperature. You want to wear gloves because this stove, the outside will get quite hot and it will get hot enough it will burn your hand. So you want, to, you want to be careful with that. And then you want to use a, a, some nice tongs or whatever that you can get in there and uh, pull the part out. And what we'll do is we'll just leave the part right there on the fire bricks and it will take... Uh, two to three hours for that to cool off. We'll come back then, we'll check the rock well, and we'll start the drawback process. You can see that uh, by opening the door, uh, you can look at the temperature. It started climbing to catch up. Or actually, it's, it's coming down. 
Uh, now that it's turned off, you can see how rapidly it will cool. So one of these ovens in the uh, summertime, uh, when it's hot out, it's going gonna, it's gonna to tax your air conditioner a little bit. But in the winter time, it actually, if you do your heat treat in the colder part of the season, it uh, helps out on the heat from that point. So you can see it drops quite rapidly. And one thing that you want to do is you want to keep the door shut until it's down to at least 500 degrees. Uh, Stan, uh, when I talked to him in Texas, he said that one of the mistakes a lot of people make, and I've seen this a lot of times, they'll want this to cool down rapidly so they can go into drawback real soon. And they'll open the door and they'll uh, leave it open. And that's bad if it's above 500 degrees because it'll shorten the life of your heating coils. But what's even worse is they'll take an air hose and start blowing that air hose in there and, and cooling off really fast. And so they're cutting down on the life of their heating coils and probably some other things in there. So just shut the door. Let it cool down naturally. Uh, it's going to take this steel uh, the block, it's going to take it a couple hours to cool down, and what I found out in the past was by the time I would let uh, this A2, which is uh, air cooling, uh, when I would let it cool down, by the time it got to room temperature, the oven was ready to go for a drawback anyways. So we'll come back in a couple hours, and we'll go through the drawback cycles. Okay, the part's cooled down now, so what we'll do is we'll uh, cut the wrapping and see what it looks like. Pull it over now by the Rockwell checker and we'll see how hard it is. It looks like we got 61 Rockwell on this part, which is good. Uh, it's over 60. We're going to drop back. Uh, we're going to shoot probably for uh, 58, 59. We'll go over to uh, uh, the computer uh, now and we'll show you where we do the settings on that. Okay, I got the uh, controller hooked back up to the computer. Uh, I don't want to run this program. It was the heat treat program. What I need now is a drawback. When you heat treat something and get it really hard, you got to drop back at a lower temperature, take some of the stress out, and it changes the structure of the steel uh, uh, so that uh, it's not as brittle. Uh, I don't need to save this configuration because I've already done it. And what I want to do now is I want to open uh, one of these in the A2. I got these set. Uh, there's the one that uh, got me about 57 Rockwell. Here's one that's 60. Here's one that uh, 61. And so I'll just choose this one uh, at 60. And it, it's probably uh, around 59 to 61 if I remember right. I'm still fine tuning some of these. But I'll just double click that. It opens up. You write it to the control. It's device number one. You can see it writing down here. When it's done, if, uh, I don't need to apply it to another device. Uh, what I need to do now is just go to the configuration and check it. And on this configuration, what it does, it shows that I'm going to 295 degrees. And I just, I just took the uh, heat treat cycle and I just changed all the temperatures to 295. Uh, it's going to come up to 295 within 5 minutes, hold at 5 minutes, and then it stays at 295, and then it's going to go for 110 minutes. So there's about uh, 120 minutes altogether, so it's 2 hours. Now the temperature for getting the Rockwell out, what I want, is a little bit low. Uh, and Stan says that uh, these controls, uh, you can set to the high side or the low side uh, for the accuracy. 
Uh, and on the low side, they're not uh, as accurate. Mine, I think, is a little bit more off than uh, some of the others that he has. But it's fine because all they have to do is I'll have to figure out what temperature to set uh, over here to uh, uh, get the desired Rockwell. And then I just save the configuration file. In the future, I'll probably buy a second control, and then what I'll do is I'll get Stan's help, and we'll set that second control for the low temperature accuracy, and we'll have the other one for the high temperature accuracy, and uh, uh, that way I can control one. A2 is the main thing I heat treat, so I can, I can control uh, with one controller for that temperature, and my drawbacks are usually around 58 to 62 in that range. Uh, so I can control the program, uh, low temperature programmer that way too. Uh, so for a lot of the stuff, I'll, I'll just swap the controllers. I won't even have to come to the computer over here uh, to check everything out. So anyhow, this, this is what it is. It's going to hold uh, the 295, and it's actually about 50 degrees to 100 degrees off, something like that. I can't remember exactly what it was at this temperature range. Uh, but uh, I know when I run this cycle that I've, I've getting right at about 60 Rockwell. So now I got this. We'll go plug it back in. You know when you're ready. Ready. So I have it turned off. I'll plug it back in. Turn it on. I got the coils. And so what I got to do uh, at this point, uh, it shows me that the temperature right now is set at 169. I knew when I got this thing cooled off that the temperature would uh, be quite low over here. So I can just take uh, this, set it in there, make sure that it's not hitting any of the coils anywhere. Hit the P. And so program is yes, hit the P again. Uh, having uh, the coils enabled or running the program, we'll just switch that to yes and hit that. And you can see its target temperature is 295. It's at 172. It'll get to 295. It'll hold there for five minutes, stay at 295 for another five minutes, stay at 295 for 110. So there'll be two hours all together. And what we'll do is we'll run this cycle. We'll pull the part out, let it cool all the way down to room temperature, and then we'll throw it back in for what they call the second draw. And we'll draw that one more time at this, uh, just run the same cycle. So most of your steel, if you want some good results on the heat treat, you want to draw them at least two times back, if not three. And uh, so, uh, uh, and, and I believe two hour minimum is what you want. And again, if they're really big parts, and then they got to be even longer. So... This will probably be it on this video. There's a lot packed in here, and what we'll do is uh, on the next video, uh, we'll actually grind this, get it mounted, and then we'll show you how we're using it. Uh, there'll be some other parts that we're making that go along with it. We'll probably show some machining on that as well. So thanks for watching, and see you next time.